Hi everyone, and welcome to today's talk in our Evolution and Ecology seminar series. For today's talk, my core organizers, Liz, Julia, Walter, and I are extremely pleased to have Professor Katie Peichel with us. Katie has been a professor at the University of Bern in Switzerland since 2016, where she's also head of the Division of Evolutionary Ecology. All the while, she maintains active ties with the Fred Hutchinson Center, uh, sorry, Cancer Research Center and the University of Washington, where she was previously. Uh, she's newly elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Katie's research focuses on the genomics of adaptation to divergent habitats, the genetic and neural basis of behavior, and on the topic of today's talk entitled, How and Why Do Sex Chromosomes Evolve? Her love for and dedication to sticklebacks is a quite a long-standing one, uh, dating back at least as far as her first postdoc project with David Kingsley at Stanford. And indeed, today's talk is not surprisingly also going to feature the sticklebacks. As usual, we'll have a Q&A session with Katie directly after a talk. Please post your questions in the designated Slack channel and upvote, upvote questions you would like to hear answered. And so without any further delay, uh, Katie, thanks very much for uh, accepting our invite and I very much look forward to your talk. Over to you. Good. So thank you very much, Andreas and the other, um, the other organizers um, for putting on this fantastic virtual seminar series. Um, I'm really um, honored to be included in this amazing lineup of speakers. Can you guys see my video, hopefully? I just want to make sure. Yeah, we're all good. We're all good. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so today what I've actually done is taken this opportunity to synthesize some very long-term projects um, that are just finally coming to fruition in my lab. And so um, this is exciting, but it's also a warning because it's the first time that I'm presenting all these results together. So I'm going to appreciate everyone's questions um, and feedback. Uh oh, this worked before, but now I can't forward my slides. You might have to click on the slide. Okay, I got, I got it. Perfect. Thanks. So um, males and females differ in many interesting ways. And in many species, including the three-spine stickleback, sex is initially determined by the presence of sex chromosomes. So females are XX and males are XY. And so um, for the past 20 years or so, I found the sex chromosome chromosomes to be the most interesting parts of the genome. One member of the sex chromosome pair here that X is large and gene rich, while the other here exemplified by the Y um, is small and degenerate. And this is also true in many systems um, in which the females are the heterogametic sex. So um, the, like the birds where you have this large and gene rich Z chromosome and this small and gene poor um, W chromosome. So this sort of convergence um, of sex chromosome evolution across many different disparate taxa has, has um, sparked the question of sort of why and how does this, does this happen? But this con convergence and sort of the level of um, what the sex chromosomes looks like is not mirrored when we look across species and we see this incredible diversity, sort of how organisms um, determine male versus female. So our familiar mammals with the XY system or birds with the ZW system, very conserved. But when we look at groups like reptiles or teleost fish, we see that they have these very different mechanisms of sex determination. Um, and then looking more broadly, plants um, and invertebrates, we see these similar patterns. So this begs the question of why such a very, this fundamental, um, process of determining male or female is so incredibly diverse and can evolve so rapidly. So these are the questions that have sort of kept me up at night and kept me going for the past 20 years or so, and that is how do sex chromosomes evolve and why is there so much diversity? Now, we have this sort of canonical model of sex chromosome evolution, um, which is that a sex chromosome start is just an ordinary pair of autosomes. And then one of these pairs acquires a sex determination gene, um, which um, can determine male, male versus female. Then over time, the idea is that there might be loci 
that have alleles that are beneficial in one sex and detrimental in the other sex, so-called sexually antagonistic loci that I'll talk about later. And this would select for um, tight linkage between a sex determination locus and these genes with these alleles with sexually antagonistic effects. This um, selects for suppression of recombination, perhaps mediated by things like inversions. Um, and then once these avert inversions and recombination is suppressed, you start to accumulate deleterious mutations, um, accumulation of transposable elements, and eventually end up with this, um, this gene pair again with the X has lots and lots of genes and the Y is this degenerate gene pore um, uh, shadow of its former self, okay? So this is again the canonical model. And much of what we know is really um, based on the sequencing of these very old and degenerate um, sex chromosomes as exemplified by like the XY pair in mammals or the ZW pair in birds. And again, um, when we look at these relatively old, on the order of 150 to 180 million year old sex chromosomes, we see both convergence and divergence. So um, there's convergence in the fact that most of the genes are gone on either the Y or the W. Um, but the genes that are maintained are those that are predicted to be sensitive to dosage. So many genes can be lost, but only those dosage sensitive genes are actually maintained. Um, now there are some different patterns as well when you look at um, the mammal Ys and the chicken W. So on the Y chromosome of mammals, you see amplification of testes specific genes, but there's no similar amplification of, of ovary specific genes, for example, on bird Ws. These amplified genes in mammals are maintained by intrachromosomal recombination between palindromic um, repeats. And dosage compensation has evolved in mammals, but not in birds and also not in many other um, groups. And so questions like, are the differences between um, Y chromosomes and W chromosomes due to the fact that Ys are always found in males and Ws are always found in females? Is it because we're comparing mammals and chickens, which have many different, um, many different biological differences? Um, or is it other factors? So we really need more examples. And we also need to understand better this progression. So how is it, or why is it that um, you go from having these sort of this early stage where there's just a sex determination locus to these highly degenerate um, sex chromosomes that we see? So work in my lab is focused on this, this intermediate stage where you start to see some suppression of a combination and some heteromorphy or differences between the X and the Y to try and understand these questions of why and how do some sex chromosomes progress to heteromorphy? So in this first part of my talk, I'm gonna focus on this how question. And this question has been a little bit hard to address um, because once sex chromosomes reach this stage where they actually are heteromorphic, there's differences between the X and Y, they can become very difficult to sequence because there's things like accumulation of transposable elements um, or inversions that are barriers to sequencing. So we've been approaching this in my favorite organism, uh, the three-spine stickleback. Um, and previous work that of my group has shown that this three-spine stickleback has an XXXY system the Y chromosome is already heteromorphic and it's on the order of 22 million years old, as I'll show you. So many years ago, very many years ago, we set out to actually sequence um, this Y chromosome in order to learn more about these earlier stages of sex chromosome evolution. Before I get into the details, what I, I want to say that what I'm gonna tell you about in this first part of the talk is all in a manuscript on bioarchive. It's in its final stages, hopefully of acceptance at a journal. Um, so if you wanna read more details, you can check it out there. And I also wanna emphasize that this work has really been brought to fruition by my former postdoc, Mike White, who now has his own group at the University of Georgia. Um, and Mike is really the hero of, of this story. Okay, so as I sort of alluded to, this has been a long and winding road to assemble this Y chromosome. So this project started back when I was a postdoc at David Kingsley's lab. And the first trait that I mapped in Stickleback when I developed the linkage map was sex determination. And I found it mapped to linkage group 19. 
Um, when I moved to start my own lab, we continued to work on this. Um, and I showed that there was in fact reduced recombination between the X and the Y chromosome on this relatively young Y chromosome. Further work in my lab, um, or so using this, um, we were excited about the opportunity to sequence this Y chromosome. And at the time, for many of you probably don't remember the dark ages, there was no Illumina sequencing. We set out to actually Sanger sequence the Y chromosome by identifying Y specific bacterial artificial chromosomes. Um, and this was funded by a, a Center of Excellence in Genomic Science grant to David Kingsley, Rick Myers and myself. And so we really set out this tedious path of sequencing um, back by back across the Y chromosome. We got a little bit of a rude awakening when we realized that this chromosome was probably more heteromorphic than we thought. My former graduate student, Joe Ross, showed cytogenetically that there were at least three inversions that distinguished the X and the Y chromosome. Um, Mike joined my lab in 2011. I said, oh, we're gonna have all this Sanger sequencing of this Y chromosome. You can assemble it, you can write a paper. It's gonna be great. Um, by 2013, we had all of the Sanger sequences of about 100 Y-specific facts. But what Mike realized is that it wasn't complete. So we thought um, we would have enough here, but we realized that the assembly wasn't complete and we were sort of stuck because at the time, sort of the next generation sequencing technologies were not what they were today. PacBio was super expensive. It was not that great in terms of error rates. Um, and so, and we didn't have any money to, to sort of go forward. So we did some Illumina DNA and RNA sequencing analyses, um, published a paper, um, but the real breakthrough, um, and then we also did some of this, with the help of phase genomics, we did some high C chromatin interaction mapping to try and link the context of our backs together. And that was helpful, but the real breakthrough came um, after I moved to Bern and I got some funding to do PAC bio sequencing of a male from the Paxton benthic population, which is the same population that we had built the back libraries from. So we're sequencing basically this, the same um, Y chromosome. And it was really this PAC bio sequencing that allowed us to um, put to, and, and the combination of the high C data, the unlimited data, um, and the Sanger back sequences that really allowed us to make um, a really nice assembly of the three spine um, Y chromosome. So I'm just gonna give you some highlights of this assembly here. Um, I really, it makes me so, so happy to see this um, Y assembly after, after so many years. And what was really gratifying to us is, is to point out that the assembly is concordant with the known inversions that we identified cytogenetically. Um, my mouse is not here. And also we were able to sequence across the centromere indicated here by this small dot. Again, this, the position of the centromere on the assembly is consistent with our cytogenetic um, data. And so I'll go into the details of these um, different inversions and, and the strata, but basically we, we don't think we have a, very, a, comp a totally complete assembly, but we think we've, we've captured most of the Y chromosome um, and is quite a, quite a nice assembly. So again, we identify three evolutionary strata, which are de defined by the levels of synonymous divergence um, that are cons perfectly consistent with these three known inversions. So this first uh, strata, stratum one, um, is about 22 million years old. Most of the genes on it are either are non-functional. And importantly, as I'll come to later, um, this strata contains the candidate sex determination gene, which is what you would predict um, given that this should be where the sex determination or the sex chromosome originated. Um, strata two is this um, dark purple strata. It's dated to be about six million years old and about a quarter of its genes are non-functional. This third strata, strata three in light purple is just a little bit younger, 4.7 million years old and about 30% of its genes are lost. What I wanna emphasize here is that this distinction between strata two and strata three was not identified by Illumina sequencing. So this surprised us when we did our Illumina sequencing because we had our cytogenetic data saying that we had predicted three strata based on the three inversions. 
Um, but I think because of the divergence between the X and the Y, a lot of those divergent reads just didn't map to the X. So we were mapping all of our Illumina reads to the X chromosome and we didn't identify this. So we were really gratified to see that the Sanger sequencing revealed um, or the, the PAC bio sequencing revealed these, these three strata. Okay. So not surprisingly, transposable elements have accumulated on the Y chromosome. So here are the, um, the sort of proportion of nucleotides occupied by transposable elements on the X chromosome, including the PAR or the pseudo-autosomal recombining region, and then the three strata on the X. They're all relatively low. These are not significantly different than on the autosomes. And you see this accumulation of transposable elements on the three strata of the Y chromosome with the most on the oldest strata. This has been observed, of course, on many um, other uh, sex, sex chromosomes that have been sequenced. Um, we also find, consistent with our previous work and work in mammals and birds, that it's the haploinsufficient genes that are the ones that re are retained. So on this graph, um, Higher values here are less predicted to be less haploinsufficient. This is based on homology with um, human genes and genes that are, have lower values are predicted to be more haploinsufficient. So um, genes that are present on both the X and the Y are predicted to be more haploinsufficient. So these are the genes that are actually retained on the Y chromosome. Genes that are present only on the X, so they um, are predicted to be less haploinsufficient. This pattern is strongest here on the oldest stratum one and weakest here on stratum, the youngest stratum three, although you can see that the trend is sort of um, starting already. Um, and this is consistent with our previous work suggesting that there's a lack of, of global do dosage compensation in three spine sticklebacks. So genes that need to be um, maintained because they're haploinsufficient are maintained and therefore there's no sort of need for, do for dosage compensation. Okay, so what about the genes that are actually present on the Y? We I annotated over 600 genes on the Y. Um, 33 of these genes have a paralog on the autosome, but not on the X, suggesting that they were duplicated and then translocated from an autosome onto the Y chromosome. Once they've um, made it to the Y, most of them have actually further duplicated, so between two and six copies. Importantly, these all appear to be DNA-based translocations. There's no intron, or they still retain introns, so they're not um, retrotransposons. We also see some duplication of genes that are present on the X chromosome. Um, so again, the y links copy has duplicated between two and, and seven times. And these duplicated and translocated genes tend to be testes biased. So on the left, I'm showing um, Genes here in black are the genes that are present on both the X and the Y in single copy. If you compare their expression, say in the testes or the brain, they're expressed at sort of equal, equal levels in the testes and brain. But genes that are either um, originated on the, on the autosome and translocated to the Y or have been duplicated on the Y tend to be testes biased um, in their expression. Um, and in fact, some of these ancestral autosomal genes seem to be testes biased in their ancestral state as well. Um, and there's been work in other systems, including uh, Drosophila, suggesting that um, these sorts of translocate, translocations of testes specific genes happen onto Y chromosomes. Okay. So one of these genes that is ancestrally present on an autosome and is translocated on the Y actually is that candidate sex determination gene in three spine stickleback. So this is a gene called anti-Mullerian hormone. It has a conserved role in vertebrate sex determination. So AMH um, promotes male um, determination and it represses female um, differentiation um, in vertebrates. And so AMHY, as we're calling it, is present on the Y, but not on the X. And it's again in the oldest stratum, stratum one. Um, it arose, as I said, from a duplication and translocation of the autosomal AMH gene on chromosome eight. It's expressed at the time of sex determination, and it has functional domains that are conserved between the, autosome, um, the autosomal and the Y paralog. So we think that this is actually a functional gene. It's expressed at the right time and at the right place, 
So we think it's likely to be the sex determination gene, but functional tests are underway in Mike's lab now to, to um, determine if this is the case. Interestingly, um, AMH or its receptor have been convergently recruited as a sex determination gene in at least four other um, fish species. So there's convergence at the level of the gene um, that's, in, that's involved. Okay, so what have we learned from sequencing of the three spine um, Y chromosome? We see these patterns of convergence in that the maintenance of dosage sensitive genes um, on the Y might circumvent the need for some sort of global dosage compensation mechanism. Um, we find if we look at the rates of gene loss um, on this Y, it's similar to other plant and animal Y chromosomes of similar ages. Um, we see similar to other systems as translocation and duplication of testes bias genes on Y chromosomes. And again, the independent recruitment of AMH as a master sex determination gene and at least now five species of fish. We, of course, we also see differences though. And the main divergence is that we don't see these massive gene amplifications that have been seen on the mammalian and also on Drosophila Y chromosomes. I think Doris Backtrog talked about that um, a couple of weeks ago. And the reason for that is, is unclear. It, it could be that um, it's just age, that this is a younger Y chromosome, although this, these amplifications are seen on the young Drosophila Miranda Y chromosome, or it could be um, that there's no um, one hypothesis for these gene amplifications as myotic drive, and that's not happening um, in our stickleback system. So still lots of um, questions to, to address. Okay. So um, to come back to this model, I've shown you a little bit about how sex chromosomes might progress through these stages from homomorphy to this very highly degenerate and heteromorphic sex chromosomes. But one important point is that not all sex chromosomes seem to progress. Um, and so again, the question is sort of why and how do some sex chromosomes actually um, progress to heteromorphy. And to emphasize this point, I'm gonna use this nice figure from a recent review from um, Judith Mink's group, which shows some examples of sex chromosomes like in the puffer fish or in frogs where um, they're relatively old. So for example, the puffer fish sex chromosome is about a million years old and it's characterized by just a single SNP that distinguishes the X and the Y chromosome and it hasn't progressed any further. Similarly, um, these sort of uh, sex chromosomes in frogs that are relative, you know, on the order of millions of years old also have not progressed to heteromorphy. So why is it that some sex chromosomes progress and, and others don't, I think is still quite an open question. And so again, we've been trying to answer these um, questions using our stickleback um, system. So let me now introduce you to um, some of the other um, stickleback species and what we know about their sex chromosomes. So I've been talking mostly about the three-spine stickleback, um, which has this XY system on chromosome 19. Um, we've discovered, um, and what I wanted to say that what I'm gonna show you on this slide is from work from both my group um, over the past many years, as well as the group of Yuhan Merila, um, and also some work from Mark Patrick's group. So my group showed many years ago that this closely related um, species Japansi, uh, of Japansi sticklebacks um, has a fusion between the Y chromosome and an autosome chromosome nine, creating this so-called X1, X2Y or Neo-Y system. And I'll show you a little bit more of that in the next slide. Interestingly, um, the black spotted stickleback also has experienced a fusion between the Y chromosome and an autosome, but a different autosome, autosome 12. Um, so two independent fusions in this lineage. Nine spine sticklebacks also have an XY system, although this appears to be a convergent recruitment of chromosome nine um, in the nine spine pangidius pangidius. I'm not gonna mention today, but within this genus of pangidius, there's actually a lot more diversity of species and also of sex chromosome systems to, um, to explore. Um, the Brooks stickleback, we're not sure what um, its sex chromosome system is. We know it doesn't involve either chromosomes 12 or 19. The four spine stickleback seems to have a ZW system, so a female heteromorphic system. 
um, again, not involving chromosome 12 or 19. And then we don't know anything about the 15 spine stickleback. But for now, I'm gonna focus the second part of my talk on this um, gastroceus um, genus um, and trying to understand both why and how um, sex chromosomes progress to, to heteromorphy. Okay, so just to give you a little bit more about these, these Neo-Y fusions, so we originally found this both through genetic mapping and, cyt and cytogenetic data. So here is a blow up of the um, chromosomes of the Japan seed female. Um, these females have 21 pairs or 42 chromosomes. Um, a probe to chromosome or linkage group nine highlights this pair of autosomes and then a probe to chromosome 19. Um, here the X chromosome highlights these two X chromosomes. But in the Japan C male, you see an odd number of chromosomes, and we see a fusion between the ancestral chrom Y chromosome and this autosome 9. And as I told you, we find a similar fusion in the black spotted stickleback um, involving a different chromosome. So here's the female, chromosome 19, um, the X chromosomes, and then um, chromosome 12 was a pair of autosomes. But here in the black spotted male, you again see an odd number of chromosomes and this fusion between chromosome, um, the Y chromosome and uh, chromosome 12. So this seems like a really interesting case to try and understand what happens when an autosome becomes sex linked. And we thought that this had occurred relatively recently in the Japan Sea system less than a million years ago. And within the last 14 or 15 million years ago in the black spotted um, system. And so some of the questions we had was how do these Neo-Y chromosomes evolve? What are the consequences of these Y autosome fusions? And did the Y chromosomes of these different species follow independent evolutionary trajectories? And then, of course, the harder question, why did these Neo-Y chromosomes evolve? What drove the evolution of these Y autosome fusions? And so many years ago, to address these questions, um, I started a collaboration um, with Mark Kirkpatrick. Mark and I um, finally were able to get some funding from the National Institutes of Health. And then we were joined by Andreas Douglas, who was a PhD student with Mark at the University of Texas. He's now um, a postdoc at UNC. Um, and Jason Sardell, who's a postdoc in Mark's group. And then Matt Josephson is a postdoc um, in my group. And so I'm going to tell you about the work that we've been doing together over the past um, few years. Okay, so one important um, thing that we, we really needed was we wanted to sequence Neo-X, we wanted to separately sequence the Neo-X and the Neo-Y chromosome. And so we came up with a strategy. Again, we started this project before uh, methods to sort of computationally phase data were that sophisticated. Um, and I'm also an old school geneticist and um, I believe things that segregate more than I believe uh, SNP calling. So our strategy here was to cross um, a male from one of the populations or species with the Neo-Y chromosome, so either Japan C or black spotted, to a female of the related three spine stickleback. Um, and then the idea is you sequence the mom, you sequence the dad, you sequence one son or one daughter and one son. And so by using SNP, um, SNPs, you can say, you can distinguish in the son and the daughter, um, the daughter would have inherited the Neo X and the old X chromosome from her dad. Um, and the son will inherit the Neo Y chromosome from his dad. So basically we, um, did four times as much sequencing as we needed to do, but then we could confidently um, phase the data and call SNPs that were either on the Neo-X or the Neo-Y chromosome. And I'm just going to digress super quickly and say, um, again, as an old school geneticist, um, when you have a cross like this and you can really you know what the segregation pattern of your SNP should be, it's sort of terrifying to see how when you change the parameters of how you call your SNPs, you can find things that don't segregate in a Mendelian fashion. And when you sort of play with your filters, you can get things that behave properly. So that's just a caution to those of you who 
um, use a lot of population genomic data to always be aware of your, um, of your SNP colleagues. Okay, so with these data, we basically were able, our goal again was to have Neo X and Neo Y chromosomes. And so we sequenced um, 15 of what we call these quartets from three spine females and Japan C males. And these were 15 wild Japan C males. So we're basically sequencing um, uh, wild chromosomes. And then we similarly sequenced 15 um, quartets that involved a black spotted male. And I'm gonna um, go through the data from, from these together. So the first result um, I'll show you is on the Japan C Neo Y. So here we have on the top, a cartoon just to help you remember. So this would be the old Y chromosome and then the Neo Y and then the Neo X um, and the old X. And so this top graph shows read depth. So um, on autosomes, the, the ratio of reads of males to females should essentially be one. Um, and in regions of the Y chromosome that are highly degenerate, you would have a lower, um, a lower read depth in males relative to females. And so on the old Y chromosome, we see the pseudoautosomal region, normal read depth, um, this sort of early um, younger strata on the old Y chromosome, there's a little bit of loss of coverage. This is that old stratum one where we see this um, loss of most of the male reads. Um, but then on this Neo X chromosome, which is a relatively recent fusion, we don't see much evidence for substantial degeneration. We, we basically see the same number of reads in, in males and females. So there's not strong um, uh, degeneration, but when we compare uh, XY differentiation, so here measured by FST, again, across the old Y chromosome, we see relatively high levels of FST between the X and the Y. And here on the Neo, between the Neo X and Y, we see high FST to about seven and a half megabases. And then you see this drop and it looks just like a pseudo autosomal normal recombining region. I should mention um, that this peak here in FST corresponds to the centromere um, of this Neo Y chromosome. So there is some degeneration. I wanna point out that previous work has sort of looked in this region. This is work from June Catano's lab. And there are some deleterious mutations accumulating here in this region from zero to seven and a half megabases. But again, without massive loss of, um, of material. Um, I also wanted to point out that here we're looking at the Japan CY, but we see very similar patterns of degeneration on the three spine Y that I just told you about. So again, here's our strata one on the three spine Y. And then these are these two strata um, that we can distinguish with our, um, with our assembly, but you can't really distinguish here with the uh, Illumina data. Okay. So we see a very similar pattern on this Neo Y of the black spotted. So now I'm showing here, um, sort of the, the male female read depth again across chromosome 12, which is the neo sex chromosome in the black spotted. And again, you don't really see much degeneration as measured by read depth. This is just showing independently male and, and female read depth. Um, so not a lot of degeneration on this ne black spotted neo Y, which is a little bit surprising because we thought it might be um, older. Um, and this is showing now the FST on um, the black spotted Neo Y. So we do see some differentiation as measured here by FST in this region of about 15 megabases actually um, on this fusion chromosome. And then it sort of drops to autosomal levels here in this pseudo autosomal region. So we don't see really any evidence for stepwise suppression of recombination. Um, but this sort of uh, definitely some differentiation across this, this region. Another interesting component is that we find much more degeneration on the black spotted Y than on the three spine Y. And so here again, this is the three spine Y chromosome sort of mapped on here. This stratum one is where we see extensive degeneration um, on the three spine Y, but in strata two and three on the three spine Y, we saw a sort of full read depth coverage. We didn't see this drop that we're seeing here on the, on the black spotted um, 
Y chromosome. So it looks like there's been more degeneration um, in these strata and actually an expansion of degeneration on um, the black spotted Y. So this raised the question to us, well, are these even the same Y chromosomes? Maybe they're just in independent chromosomes and that's why we see these different patterns. And so to answer this question, um, Jason used a method that was um, developed by um, Mark's group, this gene tree approach to determine whether sex chromosomes are homologous. Um, so the idea is that if you have a evolution of an X and a Y um, chromosome, and then there's um, speciation, that if you do gene trees, um, the X chromosomes of two separate species should be more related to each other by descent than the Y chromosomes, which are also more related to each other than they are to the, to the X. Um, so that's sort of the homologous situation. If you have independent origins, so species A and B split, and then they each independently evolve an X and a Y system, then the X and the Y of each species will cluster with each other. The thing that we were worried about is this third scenario in that there's turnover involving the same sex chromosome. So let's say we had the evolution of an X and a Y speciation event. And then in species A, this Y chromosome sort of disappeared and the X chromosome in species A sort of re-evolved as a Y chromosome. Um, this could have created a, a pattern similar to, to what we saw and trick us into thinking that these were actually homologous um, chromosomes or identical by descent. But so by doing these gene trees, you can distinguish these different possibilities. And so that's what Jason did in moving windows across um, the, cr the chromosome. And so if you look at this first region, so this is, I'm just going to put up our three spine Y map, this oldest strata we find evidence from the gene trees that these are homologous to each other. The black spotted and the three spine are homologous um, uh, in the oldest strata. But then if we look at strata two and three, we find evidence that these have independently evolved in the three spine and the black spotted stickleback. And then we find evidence here, um, this blue region, these trees indicate that this um, is pseudo-autosomal in the three-spine stickleback, but it's actually sex-linked now or in the sex determination region, non-recombining in the black-spotted stickleback. So um, there's sort of been an expansion on the black-spotted um, stickleback. So they have these homologous Ys have different evolutionary trajectories. So let me take what we've learned from the studies of these three different species and sort of try and build the evolutionary, uh, what we currently think is, is the evolutionary history of these sex chromosomes. So about 27 million years ago was a split between gastroceus and pangidius. Um, 22 million years ago, this first strata that contains the AMHY gene evolved in the ancestor of all of these species. I didn't show you the data, but we have evidence that black spotted also has this AMHY gene on its um, Y chromosome. And then in the lineage leading to three spine in Japan C, we had the formation of stratas two and three within about five to, to six million years. And then within the past million years or so, um, is the fusion of chromosome nine to this ancestral Y chromosome. Then in the black spotted stickleback, um, it looks like there's been um, independent evolution of these, what we're calling regions two and three. We haven't formally defined them as strata. And then the expansion of the sex determination region, um, what we're calling region four. So basically a, a shift in the, in the boundary between the pseudo-autosomal region and the sex determination region. And then at some point, there was also a fusion um, of this Y chromosome to chromosome 12. We can't date these events um, from our data, but the fact that there's very little degeneration on the Neo-Y portion, the chromosome 12 portion, suggests that this was a recent event in the evolutionary history of the black spotted. So what I've told you um, so far is that um, we see evidence for suppression of a combination on these Y autosome fusions. 
We don't know if these were sort of stepwise or due to the fusion itself. I would suggest based on the fact that we don't see, we sort of see a consistent FST across that um, sex link region that they, it might just be direct effects of the fusion. We see minimal degeneration on these um, fusion NeoY chromosomes. The Japan sea we know is relatively young. Um, I would suggest that the black spotted NeoY is also relatively young um, given it's the, the lack of major degeneration. Um, did these Y chromosomes follow independent evolutionary trajectories? Um, degeneration is preceded way more quickly on the black spotted Y than the homologous three spine Y. Why is this? We don't know. Um, it could be that there's just a smaller effective population size in black spotted. Their range is more limited. Our autosomal data suggests that perhaps there's lower diversity in black spotted. Um, it could be that sexually antagonistic selection is stronger in black spotted. We don't really have any evidence for or against that hypothesis. It could just be that there was random events that occurred in the lineage leading to black spotted that um, somehow captured inversions. Um, we don't really know. So it's definitely um, more, more work to do to figure that out. Okay. So in this last, um, very last bit, I want to focus on uh, this question of, of why. Before I do that, sorry, I just wanted to um, say that I think one thing that's been really valuable here to understanding this question of why and how sex chromosomes progress to heteromorphy is, is really that we have these, what we know are homologous sex chromosomes in closely related species that show these very different evolutionary trajectories. And that provides us an opportunity, I think, to now start to delve into these questions of why um, did, some, did some chromosomes degenerate more, more quickly than others. And so there's been similar studies in birds um, which have uh, homologous W chromosomes, but have experienced different levels of degeneration and also some recent work in, in Spinachia um, in plants as well. Okay, so in the very last bit, I just wanna uh, um, why autism fusions might have evolved. There's some hypothesis in the literature about why these fusions might occur. Um, drift is of course just always a possibility. Um, it's possible that there was direct selection on the fusion itself, created some beneficial mutation that was selected for. Um, Charles Within Wall had proposed that maybe heterozygote advantage was involved. An interesting hypothesis um, proposed by Heath Blackman and Jeff Demuth is that there's a this fragile Y hypothesis. Um, this could be what's going on in the black spotted Neo Y. You have this very degenerate Y chromosome and maybe um, it just needs, uh, it's losing its centromere or something like that. And, and by fusing, it can actually um, continue to, to exist. That's pure speculation. Um, Sort of the major hypothesis that we tested is this idea that sexually antagonistic selection. So uh, selection for linkage between alleles that benefit males and are detrimental in females would select for linkage to this Y chromosome, originally um, proposed by Brian and Deborah Charlesworth. And so we decided we wanted to test this hypothesis using the Japan C Neo Y. Um, and this was based on some uh, previous work from my lab. So I'm gonna just take a quick step back and tell you a little bit more about this Japanese um, stickleback. So this is work that was started by Jun Katano when he was a postdoc in my lab and his group at the National Institute of Genetics continued to work on the Japan sea stickleback. So these, these Japan sea sticklebacks evolved, we think during repeated periods of glaciation, um, over the past couple million years, which created this um, lake sea of Japan. Um, these J Japan sea fish can now be found in sympatry with the ancestral Pacific Ocean or three-spine stickleback. Um, we particularly had studied this region um, in Akeshi, um, where you can find both Japan sea and Pacific Ocean sticklebacks. These fish are morphologically, behaviorally, and physiologically divergent. Um, they probably diverged within the past million years, consistent with the geological history, 
And this chimpanzee stickleback is a, now recognized as a separate species, Gastroceus leponicus. Um, June and I had had mostly June had shown that there's strong reproductive isolation between these two species. So based on um, behavior, so Pacific Ocean or three spine females do not like to mate with chimpanzee males because of differences in body size and also this dorsal pricking behavior. Um, whereas chimpanzee females will mate with um, three spine Pacific males, but their sons are sterile. And so um, June and I had mapped um, the location of these traits that are important for reproductive isolation. And um, to quickly summarize, male sterility and male body size, um, like in many other systems, map to the old X chromosome, chromosome 19. But these behavioral differences, so this dorsal pricking behavior and also the associated dorsal spine length, map to this new X chromosome, the Neo X or chromosome. Um, nine. So it was possible, we don't know that these traits are sexually antagonistic, but we hypothesized that they might be sexually antagonistic traits and that potentially this may have led to selection for the fusion. Now we wanted to, to test this hypothesis a little bit more rigorous, rigorously, much more rigorously. And um, that's where the collaboration with Mark started because Mark um, and his former PhD student, Rafael Guerrero, had, um, had come up with this way to detect signatures of sexually antagonistic selection on recombining sex chromosomes. So the idea is that if you look at non-recombining or the sex determination regions, you have very F high FST between X and Y chromosomes. But as you move into the recombining regions of the genome, you basically are mixing up the X and the Y, but, old, but loci, and so there's no strong FST, but loci that might be sexually antagonistic, you would predict to have a high FST between the X and the Y chromosomes. And so because the Japan C um, Neo Y chromosome is still recombining, we thought that this offered an opportunity to see if we could detect these signatures of sexually antagonistic selection. And this is what Andreas Douglas has been, has been doing and looking for signatures of sexually antagonistic selection sort of on the Japan C Neo Y. Now what's important is that there's sort of, sort of this magic window, this Goldilocks window where there's just the right amount of recombination um, to detect peaks consistent with sexually antagonistic selection. And we think that this region's about between seven and a half and 11.5 megabases on the Neo and so within this region, Andreas was able to identify four candidate peaks where FST um, was higher than, um, than we would predict by just randomly um, shuffling the, the labels of the X and the Y chromosome. Um, and, in these, and this was done in 10 KB windows. And so these four um, red triangles indicate these four windows where we see higher than expected FST between the Neo X and the Neo Y chromosome. Interestingly, each of these peaks is associated with a gene known to be involved in psychiatric disorders um, in humans. So this is pretty exciting um, to us, but I just wanna raise, this is a preliminary result and um, we're worried that these peaks might be too close to the sex determination region, um, that non-recombining region where you sort of expect high FST. So Andreas is working super hard on um, a bunch of, uh, of uh, simulations to ensure that these peaks truly are within this sort of Goldilocks re region of um, recombination where we think we have the ability to detect um, sexually antagonistic selection. So stay, stay tuned um, for, for those results. Hopefully we'll have them soon. Um, but really the ultimate goal here for me is to do functional tests. So the idea would be to identify these peaks um, and then to use CRISPR genome editing technologies, which we can do in sticklebacks and you know, make females with Neo-Y alleles and males with Neo-X alleles and to really test this idea that these loci are under um, sexually antagonistic um, selection. Okay, so I'm gonna 
stop there with the data and just share a few final um, thoughts that came to my mind as I was putting this talk together. One is that, you know, sex chromosomes are super interesting, and but they're 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 hard. They're they're challenging and they're still hard to sequence. So long read sequencing, I would say, has really revolutionized our ability to sequence across these highly repetitive. Um, regions of the genome with uh, complex uh, rearrangements, but um, it's, still, it's still a challenge. And I think really one thing that I've learned is really careful attention is needed for mapping and SNP calling when you're dealing with um, these sex chromosomes. Um, I really like this um, comparison of homologous sex chromosomes and closely related species as a way forward to start to disentangle factors that might promote the evolution or constrain the evolution of heteromorphic sex chromosomes. And ultimately, I think in this genomic age, um, I don't want people to forget phenotypes, right? That what we really wanna do is be able to connect this genomic sort of signatures of sexually antagonistic selection to what are the phenotypes that are actually under selection? Are there sexually antagonistic phenotypes that are associated with the evolution um, of, sex, of sex chromosomes? So that's an important component um, for me. Okay, so I think hopefully I've at least gotten you interested in these questions of how and why sex chromosomes evolve. And I think, you know, ultimately the answers might be just as diverse as the sex chromosomes themselves. The stories I've told you in sticklebacks, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting stories coming from many other species that have different and just as interesting answers. So that's great because it keeps us all in business um, for a long time. And in fact, um, my group is starting to explore these other species of stickleback now. And already in the force find stickleback, we're finding um, all sorts of cool, new, surprising results um, that cause us to rethink to rethink how we think about the evolution of these really interesting parts of the genome. So I'm gonna stop there and I want to first acknowledge the long list of people who I've worked with over the past 20 years, starting with my postdoc in, in David's lab, my group at the Fred Hutch who really was instrumental in the, um, in the original characterization and sequencing of the three spine Y, um, my collaboration with um, with Mark's group on the neosex chromosomes, and of course our, our funding sources. And with that, um, I will take questions. I have my email here. I will answer questions on Slack, but as my lab knows, I'm pretty adverse to new technologies, so um, emailing me is always fun. Is also fine for questions. But I think I have some time for questions now, so I'll stop. All right, thank you, Katie, for a brilliant talk. A lot of stuff to go through, and it's really impressive to see how this how this has all come. It's been a long time in the making, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we do have we do have some questions on Slack, and I'm just going to relay them to you. Um, one is, what does the epigenetic landscape look like between Y and Neo-Y sex chromosomes? Oh, that's a good question. So there is some work already on by Dave Metzger on uh, like the epigenetics of the Y chromosome and three spine sticklebacks, but we haven't looked yet at the um, at the Neo-Y chromosomes. That'd be a really great question, like how, especially how is recombination suppressed on those neo um, sex chromosomes is, is an interesting question, but we don't know. Mm. Early days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next question is, is about the haploinsufficient genes and it's about how were they, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna read it out. How were the haploinsufficient genes on the three, three spine stickleback Y chromosome identified? So this is just based on um, looking at, human homologs and there's some databases on sort of predicted haploinsufficiency of of human genes and so there's no functional data there um there's also ways you can you for example it's predicted that genes that are in protein complexes might be more likely to be haploinsufficient where dosage is important and so in some previous work we'd also looked at, at those metrics but it's really just based on these homology with humans not with real data mm. I, have, I kind of have a follow-up question on that, but maybe it's a bit naive. So um, obviously then some, sometimes some of these haploinsufficient genes 
still do mutate and become uh, non-functional. Right. Is, is typically is the lineage then lost or how, how, how does the genome sort of deal with that? Well, I mean, I think in many systems, dosage compensation mechanisms have evolved. And even if they're not whole chromosome mechanisms that are gene by gene sort of dosage compensation mechanisms. So you could have a mutation, say on the X that upregulates the expression, um, you know, on the, on the X chromosome or, or mechanisms like that if, if the gene is lost. And that is a gradual process, right? With, that you've shown with the different strata having different levels of- That's of right, these. yeah. Okay. yeah. But even, even there on the youngest strata, it still seems like the genes that are being lost are those that are not predicted to be haploinsufficient. Right. Um, as another, then we have a question that's perhaps a bit more speculative um, about the choice between ZW and XY systems. Is that yeah. um, likely to be connected to the ecology and to behavior of a species? And it was like, as you've shown, in, in one of the species, there was a ZW uh, system. Um, you know, yeah, there's been some wor like wires on some, it may just be sort of random and then, um, you, you sort of get, get what, what you get. Um, you know, Mark Kirkpatrick has some, an interesting paper showing differences in life his lifespan, life history, Mark can probably is on and can correct me, between X, Y, and ZW systems, but that's not necessarily, doesn't tell you, it's just a, cor a correlation that's not sort of ca cause or consequence. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any data on sort of ecological differences between X, Y, and ZW systems, like lizard reptiles would be a great place to look at that because there's all sorts of, they're transitioning between X, Y, and ZW systems a lot. Also, um, so there you could maybe look for some correlations, but um, I don't think anyone's done that. It's a, a short call out to um, Doris Backtog and Judith Mink. And I led a working group that we called the Tree of Sex, where we tried to compile data on sex determination mechanisms in plants, vertebrates and invertebrates. And so that data set is out there and that would be a fantastic question for someone to take on with that data. Nice, yeah. Um, so are, are, are sticklebacks particularly stochastic or is it is it is that pretty much when you look closely enough, there's this sort of diversity everywhere? Yeah, this diversity is everywhere. So in fish, particularly closely related species show these, these turnovers. This has been seen in frogs as well, as I mentioned in lizards. There's a bunch of invertebrate systems where you see this sort of rapid turnover. So this idea that sex chromosomes are these stable uh, mechanisms that don't, don't evolve, I think has um, been, been debunked. <laughs> yeah, sticklebacks are not that special. Maybe mammals are just a bit boring then. <laughs> well, mammals, are, yeah. So, um, so I think that's another, more there to be found, so. it's, it's another interesting question in the field is sort of why is it that some systems are sort of are um, are stuck um, in in don't evolve and some systems are so are so labile. Um, there's some ideas about maybe once they get become sex chromosomes become fully degenerate that they're an evolutionary trap but there's data again data suggesting that that's not not always the case so mm -hmm. a, a good open question right i think we have time for one more and then i'll leave the rest for you for you up to to right. maybe look at yourself um yeah. so there's a question is what is the mo what are the most likely candidate phenotypes sorry the candidate phenotypes that may be most likely associated to the evolution of sex chromosomes. So I mean, the last point of, of checking phenotypes as well as genotypes. Yeah, I mean, so here, you know, the obvious sort of sexually antagonistic phenotypes are things that you can say like are potentially traits under sexual selection. So for example, things that are like guppies are a great example where the males are brightly colored and the females like brightly colored males, but predators also like brightly colored fish. And so it's beneficial for a male to be brightly colored, but detrimental to a female. Um, and this has also been seen in, in cichlids. So, so I think that's probably one of the first places to look. This is why this behavioral difference that we found in Japan see this 
potentially a trait under sexually antagonistic selection. Um, but those are the things that we can see as, as humans. Um, the fish may see other things. Mm. Right, thanks very much. Um, yeah, um, very clear from this that there's at least another 20 years to be okay. <laughs> research to be done down the line. Um, okay. Thanks very much. Um, our next talk is on Wednesday. Um, Pontus Scogland will be talking about the ancient, the ancient, the ancient economic, economic history of dogs, dogs, wolves and humans. Um, we hope you can join us again, same time, same place. In the meantime, as always, check uh, up for updates on Slack and our Twitter feed and keep spreading the words about these, what I think are fantastic seminars. Uh, thanks for watching and we hope to welcome you again soon.